Okay, everybody. Um, so this lecture is about the partitioning of uh, different pollutants um, in different media, specifically when we talk about environmental media that would include air, water, soil, and napo. I'll explain what napo is just in a minute. So what is partitioning? Well, partitioning is basically say if you throw something in the environment, some of that will definitely uh, evaporate to air. Some of that may dissolve in water, and uh, another fraction of it may actually absorbed by soil particle or by other chemicals as well. So, how much or what is the distribution of this chemical between the different media in the environment? Uh, that what we call partitioning. But when we talk about partitioning, it's not the regular distribution. When we call it, it's called equilibrium distribution. This one, the first word. So equilibrium distribution basically gives you, it basically it has to be lasting for a long time till the distribution of the chemical in the multiple media environment uh, becomes stable. So that that means, well, you have to wait in you know, a relatively longer time when we talk about partitioning or equilibrium condition. That might be actually um, minutes, or might be hours, or might be days or years. So that really depends on how fast this chemical is able to um, distribute itself. And that's basically what we call uh, kinetics. But another thing is um, um, we need to uh, remember this is only physical distribution. So it does not include the chemical reaction uh, involved in this uh, distribution. So for example, um, if the um, a chemical get into the river, it might react with the chemicals uh, that are already in the river to uh, so it may uh, precipitate out at the sediment, or it may actually react with uh, some chemicals in the air as well. So this is not part of the partitioning; it's a, a chemical reaction. Or on the other hand, it also uh, not involved in biological reaction. For example, if this chemical in the water, well, say sugar. And it actually uh, say a candy. Let's say that. Then it actually eaten by a fish. So and the fish will degrade it. So the the molecule of the sugar will disappear. That is not also uh, uh, it's not partitioning either because that's uh, a biological degradation. So the mass of the uh, basically the chemical changes. So the couple of different things. So just to remember. Partitioning, you have to remember on two uh, main conditions. One is it has to uh, reach equilibrium condition. The other one is it has to be mainly like a physical distribution, not chemical reaction nor uh, microbial degradation. So we talk about napos. What is napos? Um, uh, we talk about the, those uh, say, for example, we talk a lot about a benzene or BTEX. What what BTEX is? I mean, uh, this is very important acronym. I hope you would remember. This is a benzene, toluene, isobenzene, and xylene. And uh, and we also talk about chlorine salts like TCE, trichloroacetate. So those kind of chemicals, they are not soluble, like I talked. So when they actually got discharged into water, say for example this groundwater flow here, when you have BTEX actually disposing that water, most of them actually uh, will float. So in that way, we call them. So the first one we call them l nipo which stands for light non-aqueous phase liquid. So l nipo which is uh, a typical one is benzene uh, or BTEX. On the other side, when we talk about chlorine solvents like TCE, when you discharge that in water, 
actually they do not float. Instead, they sink at the bottom of the aquifer. So in that way, so they sink. So that's why we call them dense aqueous phase liquid, which is dinipole. So those are the two types of non-aqueous phase liquids, um, which might be discharged in the environment, but also they might actually uh, serve as a media. For example, if you have something else into this um, environment, that uh, d dinipole or l dinipole will actually also share a fraction of the chemical in addition to um, water, air, and soil. So those things might be serving as a um, medium as well. So that is the dinipole and the l dinipole, which is also very important. All right, so there's a, a two other kind of concepts you have to understand, which uh, also very, is very important. Uh, the first one is called saturation condition, and the other one is, like we talk about, is equilibrium partitioning. So what's the difference between these two? I mean, I wrote it in here. So basically, saturation condition is the aqueous solubility and vapor pressure when you talk about either water or air. So those two things, solubility and vapor pressure, can be found directly in the table 2.3, which I handed out to you last time. And uh, the saturation condition it describes the behavior of the chemical present in great excess in its pure and natural state. So what that means is, for example, what we, I mean, is a by its definition, say saturation, that means you have extra amount of chemical available that if you actually throw that in, say, a bottle of water, not all of them can be dissolved because there's extra. I mean, it reached the maximum point of solubility. So uh, one thing we will do in the first lab, it's a very simple one, it's just uh, if you have a bottle of water, a defined volume, we can just keep adding sugars or salts till it does not dissolve anymore, in which condition that uh, is actually the um, saturation condition. So just remember it's in extra amount, great excess, and it's a pure and a natural state. It's not a uh, kind of mixture. And uh, compared to that, equilibrium partitioning is actually uh, uh, more uh, general because uh, it when we deal with environmental pollution, generally we have compared to the medium, say the huge, uh, say the uh, ocean or a reservoir or air. Generally, we have very very large amount of solvent available or medium available to allow a large amount of uh, the chemical to be dissolved or uh, uh, vaporized. So that means in many conditions environmentally, we only see a limited amount. So we really rarely get into the great excess or extra amount that reach the saturation condition. So the second one, equilibrium partitioning, is basically it's relevant for situations where limited amount. So equilibrium is where limited amount saturation is great excess. So equilibrium limited amount of a pure chemical released or when multi-component nipple is released. So when it's a mixture or when it's a limited amount, we can say it's, um, we, we mainly refer to equilibrium conditioning. When it's a great access or pure natural state, we refer generally to saturation. But there's a note, the last one. The note gives you uh, basically if you do have extra pure chemical released, you actually reach both equilibrium partitioning and saturation because you have extra amount, right? And if it's a pure chemical. So the saturation condition is actually the maximum amount that will be dissolved, while equilibrium might be the maximum when it's equal to saturation or it may not be the maximum if you have limited amount. So that's just uh, you have to differentiate these two conditions, which can be a um, pretty good question in short answer um, uh, exams, uh, problem in the exam. 
All right. So then, how do we uh, quantify where it reaches equilibrium, where it reaches saturation, and how this chemical distributes itself? We call it equilibrium partitioning coefficient. All right. So if we think of a, a scenario, if we have a saturated solution of sugar in water, say the first box, that means when you you have the maximum amount of sugar in the water possible already, and 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 then you add another organic called glycerin. Say it's another organic. So what happens in the bottle will be well. Initially, all the sugar is in water, right? Then when you add this glycerin, due to this particle, uh, due to this partitioning, some of the sugar will actually move or reallocate into the glycerin due to its distribution, and uh, which will result the decrease of sugar concentration in water. So it shows in these two graphs. So with the time going on, so x is the time. With the time going on, you actually see the concentration of sugar in water drops. On the other side, where does sugar go? Well, the sugar actually get into the glycerin. So the sugar in the、uh, glycerin is increasing. So. There are two more things you have to notice. One is where this process reaches into a stable stage, so the concentration in the water, concentration in glycerin of sugar actually do not change anymore. We call it reach equilibrium condition. On the other side, if you adding. The sugar in water and the sugar in glycerin together, they always equal to the amount of sugar total. So that just give you an idea. I mean, how why how this thing happens? It's based on the uh uh, uh those those coefficients, which we'll talk in just a minute. So those uh so then how would we demonstrate how much? Of the sugar get into the glycerin versus in water, we use actually a ratio. We use the concentration. You have to say the final equilibrium sugar concentration in glycerin versus the concentration in water. So that's a specific example we would talk about. And in terms of the、uh, partitioning coefficient, there are three commonly used. Coefficients, because we have three commonly, uh, three common media in the environment. The first one is called air water partitioning. The first one is called air water partitioning. It say if you have chemical A, which is say the general chemical, the property of the chemical, how would it distribute itself between air and water? Will actually represent by this one. It's called KAW. Kw. So what Kw tells you will be the equilibrium concentration. So you have to understand it has to be equilibrium. It cannot be just、uh, throw in there in five seconds and then you then you measure it. It has to be in stable state. Equilibrium concentration of A in air versus the equilibrium concentration of A in water. So the ratio will give you a number called Kw that measures the volatility. So that means the higher the Kw, the higher the volatile the chemical is, right? The second one is octanol water partitioning coefficient, which is for chemical A, and the units basically uh it's a, it's a similar thing. It's basically the chemical it's called K Kow. Where it measures the concentration of A in octanol. What is octanol? Just explain a minute. It's a a, a organic solvent. What is the concentration in water in its equilibrium uh, uh state? So that coefficient measures the hydrophobicity. So that basically, the higher this number means the hydrophobic it is means it does not dissolve much, right? 
The third partitioning coefficient is called soluble water partitioning. So the thing on that it will be it's a use KD. So what is that? It will be the equilibrium concentration of A in soluble versus the concentration of A in water. So that measures say if the higher of the KD means the more of the chemical will be attached onto soluble particle rather than dissolve in water. So these are the two, uh, I mean the three uh, coefficients. So you may, one other thing that we may say is that the units of uh, different uh, coefficients actually are different. So the units of the air KW1, it will be LW, so the last units of the coefficient will be the volume of water, liter of water, versus volume, which is L, uh, of air. And uh, how would you get that? That would be, say, initially the concentration will be mass of A per liter of air over mass of A per liter of water, where you can cancel A out, then you have this liter of water over liter of air. So same as the thing for octanol and water, right? A little bit different on the soil, because soil generally are not, uh, is not measured by uh, liter or by volume, but rather by mass, right? So you actually does uh, you actually do cancel out the mass of A, but you're left with uh, flip the L water liter of water over a kilogram of soil over here. So you have a volume uh, uh, unit like that. Um, we'll talk about a couple of examples so you understand more. All right. So let's then talk about uh, uh, each of these uh, uh, coefficients. The first one is air water partitioning coefficient, KAW, that measures the volatility or vapor pressure. So it's actually very similar as compared to what we talked about vapor pressure last time. But generally, how would you do KAW? How do you know the KAW of a specific chemical? Well, generally, you don't need to uh, measure it yourself because it's a kind of, a, um, I would say, somehow uh, intrinsic characteristic of that chemical. So people have done that for you. Uh, well, you can get your KW from Henry's Law Constant, KH. Uh, I believe, um, actually, all of you should have heard of this Henry's Constant. And it also can be found in the table 2.3 where I give to you. So the current constant is actually the uh, second column from the right. All right, so it gives you, but you have to know, the so Henry's constant can give you a log number. It's not a direct Henry's constant, all right? So, well, we know Henry's constant, but we do not necessarily, that Henry's constant does not necessarily equal to KW. The only difference is actually the unit. It's not uh, really the, uh, the, the measure of it. So how do we um, convert Henry's constant KH into KW? That basically, that's this equation. So this equation gives you this KW, KH is the equilibrium partial pressure. So Henry's constant measures the partial pressure, not the concentration. Remember, not the mass concentration, we talk about KW. In air versus the concentration in water, but in molar concentration. So in order to convert this, we have this conversion. So when I will ask you, how do you do uh, KW? You basically start with Henry's constant, Henry's constant, where you can find from this table, staple. Here is a Henry's constant, so that's uh, this this row. I mean, this column gives you the um, Henry's constant number, and then you divide by R, which I'll just give you is a constant, right? And the environmental temperature, which is also constant. So then you get KW. I will give you examples just in a minute, okay? So the general qualitative 
principle for organic chemicals, like we talk about, is like the uh, partial pressure. It's a smaller, lighter, nonpolar chemical would prefer to be in air because they will be more volatile than um, bigger chemicals. And heavier chemicals um, will lo have lower relative volatility. All right, so let's uh, take a look of one example, and we'll, we'll, we'll put it in another scenario as well. It's an example from the book, but uh, it, um, but I copied it here, so you can just look at here. All right, so a closed waste container found in the lab is filled with 5 liter water, 5 liter air, and 5 liter of benzene-based solvent. Assume the solvent is composed of pure benzene. So we just talk about benzene. Determine the equilibrium concentration and mass of benzene in the water and in the air. So let's say if we have a container which has air, let's say this is a sealed container, which have limited amount of air and also water. Then you have pretty big amount of benzene, five liter in there. So where would you find benzene? Benzene is what? So benzene is L napo, right? So we talk about that. Benzene is will float. Benzene is L napo. It's part of the B tax, right? All right. So what you will find a benzene is actually it will float here. So that's benzene, right? With that, we'll say, well, then how much of that benzene actually in air? How much of the benzene in water? And if it's too much, well, some of the benzene may actually stay as a pure state. So, okay, so let's say how much. First of all, let's say how much benzene is that any is there anyway? So we have five we have five liter of benzene, right? And we know the density of benzene I give to you. So one minute. The density of benzene is eight hundred seventy six point five gram per liter. So which is the density of benzene? That will give you Four thousand zero hundred thirty eight gram of benzene. So that is the total amount you get. I mean, uh, in the bottle. Then let's say, well, out of that 4038 gram of benzene, how much in air and how much in water based on the uh, partitioning coefficient? Let's say, let's say for the 5 liter of air, 5 liter of air, 5 liter of water, for the 5 liter of air, how much benzene it can take most? That will depend on the what? That so depends on the volatility of benzene or vapor pressure. So vapor pressure represents the highest amount of benzene uh, that can be in the air, and the solubility represents the highest amount of benzene that can be in water. If it's more than that, then the benzene will not be able to dissolve anymore or vaporize, it, uh, vaporize anymore. So just to stay as it states because uh, it's saturated already, right? All right, so let's say the first uh, in water. It's easy, a little bit easier uh, to understand. So from the table, again, from this table, this table, you have to find a benzene. It's here. 
and you say the benzene's aqueous solubility is 1.64, and but you have to mention its nitro log is a negative log number is 1.64, right? So where is it? Okay, here. All right. So that basically will say. The saturation condition when the benzene reaches saturation condition, how much it has. So for benzene in water at the equilibrium condition, in this condition, that's actually let's say the saturation condition is because of one point six four is natural log. I mean not natural log, it's negative log. Then you have to convert it into this format, and we have this more of benzene. Liter of water times the molecular weight of benzene seventy eight, which is one more. That will give you. One point eight gram benzene per liter of water. Okay, so now we have five liter of water. So the total benzene dissolved in that water possible in the saturation condition will be one point eight times five liter nine. Gram of benzene in five liter of water. Okay, so that's the first step where you say for five liter of water, the maximum amount of benzene that can be dissolved when it's already reached saturation condition, which will also be the equilibrium condition in this case, because equilibrium cannot ever be higher than saturated condition, right? It's the maximum possible. Would be nine gram. Well, compared to that four thousand gram, you actually only have nine gram that can be dissolved in five liter water. So in that case, the nine gram is out both saturation condition and equilibrium condition because you have too much in there. So then let's say about air, what air looks like. So remember we have nine gram benzene in water already, right? I'm just making notes here. So now let me erase this. Let's say how much would that be benzene volatilized in that five liter of air, and whether that's saturation or not. Okay. So let's say, well, that seems a. Let's say, uh, based on the vapor pressure, that's actually the saturated is the maximum amount of benzene that uh, is able to get into the air. Uh, let's say, what is the vapor pressure or maximum allowed benzene in air first? So the partial pressure of benzene, partial pressure of benzene, will say in air. Benzene is where well, we found that it's still in this table, still benzene, and the partial pressure is just behind or a well, vapor pressure. Let's say talk about the same thing. It's just behind the aqueous solubility. So again, it's a negative log, and which is point nine. Okay. So in that one, we will need to in this way the partial pressure will be the equilibrium pressure. Um, let's say
at equals to ten to the negative point the point nine ADF, right? And if you want to get into the regular format, we have it's zero one two six ADF. So that gives you a pressure. It's a fraction of uh, uh, atmosphere pressure, and uh, in that way, we'll say, well, how does that convert that? So that's a unit conversion. Remember, we talked about last time. So that's basically how does that convert to what we want is gram of benzene in liter of air, right? So you have to convert that. Well, that what comes from the PV equals nRT. In that way, that uh, V will be what? Will be the molecular weight over the concentration, right? So then you have P times molecular weight with the concentration. And when we talk about molecular weight, we do not have N because that's only one more, right? So that's all equals to RT. To derive that, we will have this concentration. That's what we want. The concentration would be equal to the pressure we got times molecular weight over R T. Right? So then we plug in the numbers. We'll say the partial pressure we had was 0 0.126 atm times 78 gram per mole over 0 0.0821 liter ATM over more K times 298 K. So this is R, which is a con uh, constant. This is a um, room temperature, I mean, r yes, room temperature, right? So this number, uh, generally, if, uh, if I test you, I'll give it to you because it's a constant. So for that, we basically we can cancel more K, more K, and we have ADM, ADM. So we end up with a gram per liter unit, which is great. And we have a 0.4 gram. All right. So then the concentration. In, even in this partial pressure condition, which is a saturation condition, we will have about 0 0.4 gram per liter of air. So in that way, we'll say, then how about 5 liters? Well, it's very easy. So we have 0 0.4 gram per liter times 5 liter. We have about 2 gram. Of benzene. So that would validate the assumption actually because even the highest partial pressure possible, so the vapor pressure, it only there only um, be two gram of benzene in five liter of air. And this is five liter of water. Okay. So then, totally, you would only have eleven gram of benzene that actually get into air and water. Well, the majority amount of benzene. Remember, we had we had like a four zero three eight gram total. So the majority amount of benzene actually still keep its pure form.
as pure benzene, while only very tiny amount get into air and water. So that's one example that will de actually demonstrates the saturation condition and equilibrium condition. So in this case, your saturation condition is the same as your equilibrium condition because you have large actual amount of benzene available over there. Then how about, well, if we do not have enough amount of benzene, say we only have, say, you know, okay, maximum you have 11 possible, say, how about I only have one gram? Then how would I calculate? You definitely cannot do this way anymore, but we'll do that next time. All right, so talk about that uh, uh, air water partitioning. Um, we we'll talk about the second one. It's called octanol water partitioning, or KOW. So it is an indicator of the hydrophobicity, which means how uh, soluble it can be, or uh, how uh, insoluble it can be. So why octanol? Well, octanol is a, a pretty good surrogate that represents the behavior of organic issue, tissue. Say, for example, plant tissue, animal fatty tissue, oil or something. For example, our uh, fatty tissue in our body. So the mo so it's a kind of a, a proxy for that. So you definitely you don't need to test um, in using uh, real tissues, right? So use al al alcohol, uh, octanol as a surrogate. So... Um, the early days, like I wrote in here, the early days is actually use octanol to present uh, to represent blood. This is also organic type of thing, even though majority, I mean, which is uh, uh, basically represent the water and how would that uh, 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 distribution is as compared to the organic tissues. So. The octanol uh, coefficient is actually uh, very easy to find. It's actually also this table is uh, is the last one. The octanol water coefficient is in its log format. Okay, so the last uh, uh, column shows you the octanol coefficient over here. So you just just find it directly here. And the general qualitative principle for that would definitely the heavier nonpolar would prefer to be in octanol. It's heavier. It's try to a uh, nonpolar because octanol is nonpolar, it's organic. So it will um, actually your KOW will larger than one. And the other one, if you have lower and polar groups, because water is polar, and then it's smaller than one. So some example of the uh, octanol water coefficient. Give you say what kind of a formula it can be, uh, what kind of type of uh, 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 compound they are. Give you the number. So for example, you just say this uh, octanol. If you have water in water, which means for one more part of oct uh, that water dissolved in water, there's only point zero. I mean zero point zero four more in octanol, which means this is very small number, very small number, very small than one, means, I mean, water dissolves in water rather than octanol, right? So if you have methanol, propanol, say methanol is not that much uh, dissolved in octanol, but rather because it's smaller than one, that means it's hydrophilic, that means it tends to dissolve in water, but if you have more carbon, actually you have higher. So basically, for propanol, two parts will dissolve in octanol organics, and one part will dissolve in water. So then you'll say there's uh, more and more numbers, higher and higher, based on this different uh, 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 chemicals. Say for example, TCE is about 195 times one, right over one. And then if you say PCB, that's why always we have talked about uh, last week, or DDT, how, how big this number can be. Say for one part that's dissolves in water, you actually have more than 100,000 parts actually will actually stick with organic uh, tissue. That's why you cannot use water to flush it out 
in, from your body, that means it's very toxic. It would just stick with your tissue because it has a very high octanol coefficient number and also say very low solubility. All right. So that mean was that uh, uh, tells you about the uh, pollution control. Well, definitely, you, when you know the KOW, when it's very high, that means it's very hydrophobic. You definitely cannot really uh, deal with in water because it's not in water in any way. All right. So the last one I'm going to talk about uh, in the partitioning uh, coefficient is the soluble water partitioning coefficient. What gives you is a, a characteristic of uh, the uh, the chemical in water versus in soil. But in soil, there's a little uh, a one little uh, additional step, which basically says the soil has two different uh, uh, things. One is organic carbon, so those are dead plant tissues, bacterial tissues. Those are the carbon which we call OC. Is a matter that uh, actually responsible in attracting those chemicals, those organic chemicals we talk about. Rather, for those inorganic part of the uh, uh, soil, for example, sand, they do not actually attract or absorb actually organic chemicals. So, in order to do that, we have to understand first of all how much of the organic fraction of the organic carbon or organic mass fraction in soil and then calculate how much of the chemical attached on the organic carbon. All right, so just one additional step. So how do you know that? Well, uh, in our first lab, we'll do that uh, also. So basically, you, it's a basically for one, for this much of kilogram of soil, how much kilogram of organic carbon, organic matter has there. And basically, we will do very easy sample. Say we have one uh, sample of soil with a mixture of organic and inorganic matters. Then you can use a filtration, and you can use the furnace to burn those organic up. And then you can only have those uh, 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 say inorganic left. So you basically can calculate the uh, fraction of each part. Uh, what is the difference between the organic carbon OC and organic matter OM? Generally, uh, OM is about two times of OC because C5H7O2N is a general formula of um, uh, organic material. And within that, see, if you have 5C, that's 12 times 5, you have 6. 60 plus 7 times 1, that's a hydrogen. Uh, 16 times 2, 16 times 2 is oxygen, plus 14 is N, which has a molecular weight of 113 gram. Well, within that 113 gram, 60 gram is the carbon, so it's rather, rather, roughly like a half of the uh, total weight, right? So that give you a rough amount of two uh, times. So for organic pollutants that attract to the organic portion of soil, how do you calculate that? First of all, it's partitioning coefficient between OC in water. Basically, then you have the OC, the concentration of A, which is a chemical we are interested in, in the organic portion of soil um, versus it's A in water, right? And then OM is the same thing. It's just two, generally it's two times. And then how would you know the KOC and KOM? Here, KOC and KOM. Well, KOC and KOM are strongly correlated with KOW. Remember KOW is what is the octanal coefficient, right? So that would give you A relationship once you know the KOW, which is on this table, and then you will be able to calculate OC and OM. Then, how do you do that? Well, it has a very simple correlation. Say, for example, the KOM, it actually is A log KOM equals to A times log KOW plus B. 
So when you know KOW and you know A and B, you will know KOM. So where do we find A and B? Well, it's very easy actually. It, uh, again, this is uh, uh, in the book. So when you have a, um, a aromatic compounds, for example, benzene, for example, B-tax, let's do it this way, say B-tax. So the all, all organic compounds, we talk about organic compounds like benzene rings, right? Then gives you the A, which is 1.01, .01, gives you the B, which is negative 0 0.72. So that's the, that's the aromatic compounds, you can find A and B, you can find KOW, you can find KOM, all right? So for chlorinated compounds, for example, TCE, you basically, you also have a different A. So A is 0 0.88, B is a negative 0 0.27. So for the TCE, you have to use this A and the B set. For B tax, use the first B A and the B set, okay? Don't mix them up. Then if you have other things, you use different A and Bs, but in here we generally uh, we only talk about these two groups. Okay. So once you know the KOM or KOC, this we talked about last slide, and you multiply that by the FOM, so the fraction of organic matter in soil, which I talked about uh, in here, right? Through experiment, you can test that. Then you multiply them together, you got Kd, which is the real uh, soil water coefficient. And the same thing happens in KOC. So let's, uh, let's say an example over here. If we have 100 gram organic matter, which is OM, included in the container of example 3.1, which was a a large amount of benzene in the container, what will be the maximum concentration of benzene in the OM? And what is the maximum mass of benzene present in the OM? So we ask like the concentration first and the mass the second. So this actually is the same example as the last one we talked about. It's this, this one. So you have the same thing in here, but rather you actually added some organic matter in here, say a big, big particle, then what happens will be some of this benzene will actually attach on those particles, soil particles, organic matters, will actually, those particles will grab a couple of benzene, uh, benzene molecules as well. So then, when you add this blue particle in there, everything going to change because well, not necessarily, but uh, uh, the allocation will change because this particle will actually attract some of those benzenes, right? So because we have a large amount of benzene available, we'll say how much the particle are able to actually get this, but, well, certainly we'll doubt that we'll actually accept all four gram because um, it's actually, uh, four kilogram is actually a lot. Rather, we actually think, well, Make common sense, still 9 gram will be in water, 2 gram will be air, because there are sufficient amount of pure benzene that will be actually get into the organic matter. So come back to our question. Let's say, let me draw this again. So we have this container, we have air, we have a particle, so that's OM, and we have water. So then there's a benzene, some of the benzene will be air, some of the benzene will be in water, some of the benzene will be on the particle, and the, the, there are probably some amounts left still, right? So the right one is benzene. All right, so let's calculate that. All right, so in order to do the, uh, we need to calculate the concentration in the OM. So basically, that's the, uh, we need to know the KOM, right? And then we know the concentration, right? So let's find KOM first. 
How do we know KOM? Well, go back to what we talk about. KOM can be calculated from KOW from this slide, right? So then let's say we know the relationship log KOM equals to A times log KOW plus B, right? And because we talk about the benzene, it is aromatic compounds, so we know A is what? Aromatic compounds, A is 1.01, .01, B is negative 0 0.72. So then A is 1.01 .01 .01 .01 log KOW. What is log KOW of benzene? Get to this table, find the benzene, OW log, uh, OW is, uh, log KOW right here, 2.13, right? So that's 2.13, B is negative 0.72. So that gives you a number of 1.47. So that's the log KOW. And then the KOW will be 10 to the 1.47, right? As 27 liter water kilogram OM. Okay, so then we know KOW. We know KOW already, so the first unit. And we need to know the fraction of OM. We will know KD, right? Well, it did not ask you KD. Um, well, in this case, so FOM is what? FOM is actually 1 because it's all organic matter. It's the total, right? But it asks you the concentration of OW, OM. So then the concentration of OM will be KOM. This is all benzene. Times... the concentration of benzene in water in a slippery condition. So where is it? It's here. So when you want to know the concentration of o, uh, OW, sorry, OM here, you know the concentration in water times the, the efficient we just talked about. All right, so then you have 27 liter of water over a kilogram OM times 1.8 gram, gram of benzene, liter of water, uh, we calculate this time. So last 1.8 was actually calculated last time, remember? That's why 5 liter of water we had the total 9, alright? Remember that. So we have 48.6 gram of benzene per kilogram of OM. So this is the maximum amount that one kilogram of um, uh, of that matter is able to actually attract, right? So that's a concentration. But how about for hundred organic matter? How much we can attract? It's fairly easy, right? So the amount will be 0.1 kilogram. That's what we have. We have hundred gram, which is 0.1 kilogram, times 4.48.6 which is 4.86 gram, 
frequency. Right? So total will be uh, 4.86 gram of benzene that will be trapped in the OM. So in this case, we'll basically, uh, we did not say KD because it's 100% OM, right? So it's actually fairly simple. If your OM changes, we'll change that. But uh, just to, to get to an idea on that, if you have a large amount of benzene, remember you have like a 408, let's say, Four zero thirty eight gram of benzene total. Within that, you have nine gram in five liter of water. Two gram in five liter of air, and four point. Eight six gram in a hundred gram of OM, right? So even you add all three together, it's nothing compared to the four thousand gram benzene in there. So the majority of the benzene is still in pure state. So in this condition, benzene did distribute itself into air, organic matter, which is soil or water. So into three media. But because you have extra amount of benzene in there, you actually reach saturation condition in both in all three cases, as well as equilibrium condition. Because in this case, your equilibrium condition is the saturation condition. So uh, that's actually for today. Uh, next time we'll talk about uh, two things. One is how about if you only have limited amount of benzene? Say you only have say. One gram of benzene, what would happen? Well, then the other three media will actually fight for the benzene, right? To be in a, uh, in each of the medium. So how do we allocate that? And the way how to do it, it's totally different. The other one we'll talk about, how about you, if you do not have a pure, couch, uh, pure chemical, rather you have a mixed chemical, how do we do that? All right, thanks so much. Actually, uh, that's for uh, today.